to Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation for sponsoring today's video. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this week's Lunch with a Scientist. Today, we are joined by Dr. Giselle Montano. She is originally from Brazil and has a veterinary medicine degree from the National University of Mexico, as well as a master's degree in animal science from Texas A&M. She has worked as a research associate for SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Species Preservation Laboratory since 2011. She was recently named Director of Species Sustainability. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring Giselle in. Hi Giselle, thank you for joining us today. Hi Jen, hi everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation about what I do. We're very excited to hear about it. So we start all of our Lunch of the Scientists with a little introduction into how our scientists got into their field of study. Um, so with that, if you wanna go ahead and get started, um, we'd be excited to hear from you. Yes, okay, so the title of my presentation is Application of Assisted Reproductive Technologies in Sharks. So what happens is that I am a veterinarian and what I really liked to, to focus my study on was animal reproduction. So I'm gonna talk about all the things that we can do in the laboratory and in the parks that we have and also in the field. So if you go to the next uh, slide, I can show you how I have always liked science. And I think that's because my dad, well, it was a very big uh, influencer in my life. He is um, a veterinarian also. He is a um, He's a virologist and immunologist. So he gave me this stereoscope and I, I really liked, and I always liked science. So I always wanted to be a veterinarian, but I think it's because I saw him and I wanted to be like him. So, so I studied veterinary, uh, veterinary medicine in Mexico. My dad's Mexican, my mom is Brazilian, and I wanted to, to, to know uh, more of the culture of my, the other side of my family and and um, just know another. Uh, I just wanted to know my family and the culture uh, that I was missing because I was living in Brazil. So I went to study veterinary medicine over there. And I found out over the years that I did not like clinics very much. And I, when I had my class that was animal reproduction, I just fell in love with it. And I knew that that's what I was gonna do. And, but I always wanted to work with the wild animals. So I just imagined that if I could, if I could work with reproduction in wild animals, that would be like the ultimate dream and I would be really happy doing it. And I, but because I was Brazilian and Mexican, I thought I was going to work with animals from, from the forest, from the jungle. So I thought I was going to work with jaguars, with um, anteaters or ocelots or monkeys or something like that. But, but I have, but, but we have a few facilities that have dolphins in Mexico city. So I have, I was I was wondering um, if I could if I could participate in a project in the Department of, of Reproduction and the only thing they had was dolphin and like over and over like every semester they only had oh no we only have this project with dolphin it's like well okay so so <laughs> I signed up for it and I loved it I loved it because working with dolphins it's very easy because they can be trained for so many behaviors so everything is voluntary and I could get my samples that I wanted to work with I could examine them and do an ultrasound and they wouldn't move. So I could do the science in this species. And then I loved that, that combination. And I did my master's degree. Then I got a master's degree in Texas A&M in animal science. Everything focused on reproduction. And my experiment was also in dolphin reproduction at the laboratory, the reproductive laboratory at SeaWorld in San Diego. So I went there to do it. And after I graduated, I stayed at SeaWorld and I have been uh, 
working for now 11 years and and I have and working for that laboratory gave me the opportunity to work with many other species so always on reproduction so I made it somehow it, it, my dream came true and and this is how I ended up here the one thing that I want to say also is that we don't work by ourselves. So we are we have we are always part of a group and we are always part of a team. So this is my team. You know, I, we have Amanda, we have Dr. Robeck who founded this laboratory and Angela and Karen who is our endocrinologist and lab manager. So uh, a lot of them are in Orlando and then two of them are here and uh, a lot of them a lot of them are in San Diego and then two of us are here in Orlando. So we divided the laboratory because we wanted to establish a reproductive laboratory in Florida. And um, it's very nice to work with people that have the same mindset and all, that want the same goals. And it's uh, very nice to be in a team that works well uh, because we don't work by ourselves. We always make the projects and the, the publications and, and we always work in a very collaborative way. So what is exactly the, this thing, the assisted reproductive technologies? So it's just a series of techniques, protocols and methods that are going to allow us to produce a large number of offspring or we can, if we have uh, an animal of male or female that have problems in re reproducing, we can go there and we can help this animal and we can get offspring from them. Okay, so, but this is the goal for the farm animals because you do wanna have a large amount, a uh, large number of animals for uh, in the farm, correct? Now, we can use those techniques and those protocols and we can adapt so we can use in our animals. So our animals are wild species. It's not the same. We don't have the same numbers. We have different problems. We have different goals, but we can use very similar techniques so they can prove it and they can uh, prove that it's safe and we can adapt and then we can... Um, evaluate and see if we can use for our species. So we can see a, this is an ultrasound. On the left is an ultrasound in a mare. We have all sites uh, from a cow and that's the positioning of sheep when you wanna do AI, uh, which is artificial insemination. So the first techno technique or technology that I, I wanna talk about is the ultrasound. And the ultrasound you can use in males or females. Um, in many species, so this is a dolphin, a white spotted bamboo shark, and a sand tiger shark. We can tell if they are sexually mature, so we can see the testes, or we can see the ovaries, we can see eggshells, we can see pregnancies. Uh, it's a very, it's a very good way to know what is happening uh, to the animals. So here is some of the images. The first image on the left, uh, the part that it's darker, that it's black, it's called hypoechoic, that's the bladder, and very near on top of it is the testis of a dolphin. The second image, um, it's a female dolphin, and that um, the circle that is um, black, that it's hypoechoic, that's a follicle. So that's an animal. You can see a little bit of the ovary. Ovary is, is a little harder to see, but you can see the follicle of this animal that she is about to ovulate. So then this way we know where in the cycle an animal is in a very easy way. The third image is the ultrasound of a fetus, it's a dolphin fetus, so you can see the jaw that's hyperechoic, so that's very white, and that's the jaw and the little teeth, and then you can see the eyes and a little bit of the head. On the right, on the top, the, those 
things are eggs. So they are eggshells from a nurse shark. And they also see like hypoechoic. And um, on the bottom is an image that I got from internet. And that image became very famous because it's a fetus of a tiger shark. And I believe this is the first image of, um, of an embryo of a of tiger shark. So it's just amazing that you can go in the field and get your ultrasound probe and see, check if the animal is pregnant and make an estimate about how many pups this animal is going to have. Another technique that we use is the semen collection. So we can do a semen collection in many species. There are many different ways to do it. So for sharks, when the shark is small, we usually just do a massage. So we massage the, the um, near the cloaca and we separate the claspers. Claspers are these structures coming out of the pelvic fin. So they are pelvic fin modifications. And um, okay, so you have to separate. And then inside in the cloaca, you can see there is a papilla. Okay, so if you're doing a massage in a small shark, then the semen is going to come out of that, the papilla. And then with a syringe, you just aspirate your sample. But for a large animal, you cannot do the massage. So what we do is that we insert a catheter. So I put a picture there with a catheter and an adapter and a syringe. On the left is a picture of a sand tiger shark, and on the right is a white shark. So just for comparison of the size of the animals and the size of the claspers and the whole situation, because on the left, we have a lot of people holding the animal in the water. And then on the right, the animal is on a platform and it has a hose right? It's receiving water for the gills. It's getting wet uh, with a bucket of, full of water. So uh, we keep this animal um, this way on the platform and then we can get our samples. Um, okay. So this is in our park Then I have to get many times. We have to travel and take our own equipment and our microscope and our pipettes and everything so we can do an assessment. On the right, you can see this is a spermatozoan. It's a sperm cell from a nurse shark seen in a microscope. And then once we have our sample, we can do a semen evaluation. So we can analyze a few sperm characteristics and we can tell that is going to tell us the quality of that sample from that animal. So viability, which is membrane integrity. We say it, we usually say that the sperm cell is dead or alive. So in the first picture that those are uh, sperm cells from killer whales. And on the left, we have a um, live one. It looks white because it didn't absorb the stain. On the right, we have um, abnormal head and because, because it's kind of rounded and it's very pink. So that's not a viable sperm. On the left, you can see the shape is like a paddle. It's very rectangular. So that's completely normal for killer whales. On the next picture, there are four spermatozoa from dolphin and they have different shapes. Um, we want to see the normal shape is the one on top, that it's very small. Uh, and if it's white, that means it's alive. So this is how we do this assessment. And the third picture is a um, spermatozoon from white spotted bamboo shark. And on the last picture is just a picture of a hematocytometer. This is how I count the sperm. So I have to count all the sperm inside this big square that has the other small square uh, squares. And then I use a formula and I know how uh, what is the concentration of spermatozoa in my sample that I got from a shark or from another species. And I can look at morphology, that's the shape of the cells, uh, the concentration, which is the number, and then motility. So I can put the sample in a microscope and see how the cells are swimming, if they are fast, if they are going straight, and all that's going to be the quality of our sample. Something else we can do is to cryopreserve. So cryopreservation is the freezing and uh, artificial insemination. And this is, we 
do we do like to cryopreserve our samples because they can last for a long time in liquid nitrogen and because then we don't have to transport our males and separate males and females because we prefer to use this male or we prefer to use this female or we have three parks in three different states so we can just transport uh, frozen spermatozoa instead of transporting a, a male and introducing to a group and all that. So, so this is kind of the way to do it, okay? So the first picture is a tube with, um, with semen. It's diluted. In this case, we use the egg yolk to dilute and other, and other things, other buffers and um, antibiotics, etc. There are We use two different ways to freeze. One is in the straws, which is the picture with the the red, the, the, the red things are, are straws and they are being in a vapor of liquid nitrogen. On the bottom, we see glass tubes. So those vials, they're very nice because you can freeze two meals or five meals or eight meals. And it's very different from the straw because the straw is a quarter of a meal or half a meal. So it's you have to freeze many of them. Uh, so it's just more practical to use the glass tube. So we have had a lot of studies on that, doing the, that type of comparison and validating this new method. And then you can see all the tanks. So we have a lot of tanks. That's our genome bank. So we can bank um, spermatozoa from many animals. And then we can choose um, uh, how many samples are gonna we're gonna mix it to make one artificial insemination dose and then we can use in one animal so then on the bottom we have a tank and i'm getting um the cane out to to put a sample inside so the sample is inside the tank with liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees and it's we it's known that that uh is gonna the cells in this way with a cryoprotectant they survive for a long time for many many years for decades actually we don't know when they are gonna expire or go bad so you can always use it even after 50 years or 70 years it's okay to use it and then the pictures on the right are uh, artificial insemination in dolphins. So this is something that we do to manage our population. This is the, the, the way to do in the best way possible and, and for the genetics of the, 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 the collection that we have, right, for our population. Something very nice that it can be done is the hormone monitoring. So then you can get a, a sample of blood or urine and you can analyze it and pro you can process it and analyze it and see which hormone you can find and how much. So if you get urine every other day or every week, you can do a characterization. It can do a very nice graph. You can tell when the animal is going to ovulate or if an animal is pregnant. So there are many things you can analyze. Uh, estrogens, progesterone, uh, testosterone, we also thyroid hormones, glucocorticoids. And you can tell if an animal is uh, sexually mature or, like I said, gestation, if it's pregnant or see when the animal is going to ovulate. So all that help us to identify our animals in our collection, but also help us to characterize this. So we know this information of the reproductive biology of, of many species and we can make comparison with other animals that are um, living um in the wild so how uh, and one of the difficulties of studying reproduction in sharks specifically is that sharks have so many different ways to reproduce so some of them uh, lay eggs and that's the oviparity some of them are going to hold that eggs they have they produce the eggs but they are not going to release them they are going to keep it in the uterus and then the eggs are going to hatch the embryos are going to come out of the egg capsule they are going to consume that egg yolk and then they are going to keep growing inside the uterus before they are born so there are different ways that that can happen and one way is that the, um, the uterus are go is going to produce uh, substances that are nutritious for these embryos or the embryos are going to eat some e other eggs that are infertile and these 
embryos are going to eat and get nutrition from that because it's just egg yolk. Or one specifically one species that is very interesting is the sand tiger shark. So the embryo you have you have in the sand tiger shark two uteruses and a lot of embryos in each one of them. Okay, so the strongest embryo in the right side is going to eat the the egg yolk from the eggs and also is going to eat its siblings. So then in the right uterus you're only at the end you're only going to have one embryo one pup and then on the left side the same thing is going to happen so then you can only have maximum two pups coming out of this female per cycle and this is why some of the sharks like this one sand tiger shark the reproduction is so slow so it's very important to protect this species because it takes a long time for them to be sexually mature and then they only have two pups every three years this is what uh, the studies have concluded that it takes three years. This cycle is every three years, so it's very slow. So they need uh, a lot of attention. But okay, and then the third way of reproducing is a viviparity. So that means the the shark is going to give birth, but this animal is going to have the pups are going to have a placenta, and uh, this is this is very different. So it's not an egg; it comes with a placenta. And this picture that I have there, this diagram, I got it from internet, but I don't know who did this, and I couldn't find. I went back, and I couldn't find who who did it, so I don't have a reference for this. So I apologize if I find out, I'll, I'll put it there. The animals that we have here, as far as sharks, the one that I really like to work with is the white spotted bamboo shark because it's a, a small animal. It's very easy to handle. And we know the reproduction. We know how they reproduce. There is no problem at all. So Giselle, why are you studying them if they don't have any problem? Well, because when we study something that we have a large number of animals and it's easy to do it then we can learn we can learn we can characterize it we know exactly how it works and then we can use it as a model for other species that are in trouble that we don't have many of those animals that they are not reproducing very easily so i have learned so much with this uh, little guys, they are like from 80 to 90 centimeters long. And you can see here, for example, those are the eggs that they lay. Uh, they are like leathery. And um, the, the one on the, le on the right, in the picture on the right, that they are very transparent. You can see one has egg yolk inside, the other one doesn't. So sometimes that can happen and they have that um a lot of fibers from the egg and because in the wild those animals the the eggs go and fall on the ground on the substrate and the 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 tide the water doesn't take them away so then they are they don't move a lot so they stay in one place so that's important for the success of of this uh, eggs to hatch okay so so that is a very transparent case on the middle on the top middle picture that it's um that's like a twin it's two egg yolks you can observe there's two egg yolks but they never they are never successful so those we have to discard after a week or 10 days because they just don't go forward and some of the egg cases i just put it on, as an example they are very dark it's hard to see it we have to get a flashlight and put it on the back and try to see it and what do you want to see so in the bottom pictures you can see on the bottom left um you can see the egg case the egg yolk and there is a little dot like a little bump in the egg yolk so that's the germinal disc that's where the oocyte is located and that's where the fertilization is going to occur so then in the middle picture there is a tiny like a white little thing that measures like two millimeters and you can see it well that's the embryo developing from the germinal disc and that embryo is going to grow is going to consume the egg yolk and then on the bottom right you can see 
now the um, the embryo almost ready to hatch uh it's just it has to turn so there is one of one side of the egg that they they hatch from so this is very interesting to observe we can also study the female and how she produces the eggs and i can see the ovaries on the ultrasound i can get blood and measure the hormones and i can get semen from the male we can do artificial insemination so this is the whole picture for this species. Another species that we have here in the park that I can study is the nurse shark. So that's a very nice picture of a nurse shark on the top. They are very, uh, they are brown. They look very like, like sand paper. Their denticles are very, like very thick. It's a very different feeling from all their other sharks. So the way that they reproduce is that they produce eggs. However, they don't release the eggs. They keep the eggs inside uh, in their uterus. The eggs are going to hatch. The embryos are going to come out and uh, consume the rest of the egg yolk. They are going to grow much more. And uh, the female is going to give birth. Okay, so this is species, this is a historically in the all the aquariums they don't breed very well so they don't they don't reproduce very well and nobody really knows why there is on the picture on the last picture you can see some of the pups and uh, that aquarium is in brazil and that's the only one that i know that they have had success like every other year because the cycle is every two years every other year they have a litter so this is sometimes you have a species that it's very successful. Sometimes you have a species that it's not very successful uh, at the breeding and in aquariums. And then it's nice to be able to study them because especially nurse sharks, they are all over here in the coast of Florida. So um, we can make comparisons and then um, have a better picture of what is happening to them, right? So by studying our animals here, um, we are uh, AZA certified institution and uh, there are many zoos and aquariums that are. We always recommend the people to, to make sure that the, when they visit places that they are AZA certified. And there are groups of studies, they are called species survival plans. So many species belong to this group. So that means uh, there are more than 500 programs right now, and um, AZA have people, experts on each species, and they are going to try to come up with a better plan for them and see if we can move gametes or if we can move animals uh, so we can have a pair. So the SSP is going to give advice on which animals we can put together to make pairs and we can have pups or calves that are genetically diverse. And this is very, very important for us because we do want to have animals for a long period of time. Uh, it's a long plan, a uh, long term plan. So this is this is very helpful. And because we study reproduction, then we are very close to what are the guidelines and advices that they give us. And also our studies and the, the species that, that we have, they, um, they, they help other animals that are in the wild because you can build a database of what is normal because how do we know, you know, how do we know when this animal, when the animals breed, how do we know what age they, they, they become sexually mature and how many pups they can have, how many calves they can have, what do they need for that? What is the metabolic need for, for this animal and lactation and how long is the pregnancy? So many of these questions we have answered in anim our animals here. And then uh, when you're going to study animals in the field and anim animals that are in the wild, you can use that data and uh, use it when you are observing the animals uh, in the wild. And when you get an animal, either a dolphin or a whale or a shark, and you can get one sample from a shark or one sample from um, a whale, and then you say, okay, 
what is happening to this animal? Is this animal pregnant? Is this animal going to ovulate? You know, or is animal is this animal sexually mature? Because the size it looks like it, but what if it's not? You know, what if it's become immature? But we don't know if this animal at this place in time it is. So okay, because we have done so many times, because we have had to get uh, blood samples from the animals so many times. And we have done that. We have done that work. So then you can just do a comparison. You can have a better idea. You can estimate all this. Uh, so I feel like we use our animals really as a model to study them. And this science is going to help animals that are out there. And many species do need our help. And so you know this animal uh, in the wild, where are the nurseries, where are the mating sites, and do, do we need to protect because maybe there are a lot of boats out there and we need this, this place to be calm and we need the animals to be able to go there without a lot of influence, a lot of uh, disruption from people, right? And re recovering of endangered populations too because we can release animals and help to recover some some of these species and of course because the reproduction is such an important part of the biology for any of these species is it's it needs to be known we need to know just to educate so we know what we have in our planet one species that is very hard to study is the white shark so we can have this species in the aquarium. Sometimes some of them have the juveniles, but then after they reach certain size, they have to be released. And it's very, very difficult to study this animal. Um, this is this is an example how sometimes, uh, like randomly, you get an animal in a fish market, like this female in Vietnam, uh, 2019, and when they realized that this animal was pregnant they opened her and she had 14 pups in um, um in a full size they were 14 full size pups and that's very unfortunate for us we studied this animal it's very unfortunate but this is the the um in this way now we know that they can have 14 pups because the other um, the other publication was that that we knew about it. It was only two, so now we know that they can have between two and fourteen at least. Um, so it's just to illustrate how sometimes it's sad and 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 difficult, just difficult to study some of the species. So specifically about the white sharks, uh, because it's so hard to do it. Um, we, SeaWorld is collaborating with OSEARCH. So OSEARCH is a nonprofit organization that used this Alaskan crab vessel of 126 uh, foot long. And uh, we go on expeditions. The expeditions are three times a year. And our goal is to catch these great white sharks, bring to the platform, and do a lot of uh, get a lot of samples, get a lot of measurements, and then release the animal back into the water. So this study is focused only in the population that lives in the Northwest Atlantic, so the East Coast of the United States and Canada. And the goal of the study is to the goal of the study is to analyze samples from a hundred animals. So there is online uh, all this information. Uh, we call it sci science briefs. We have more than 20 studies um, happening per expedition. And one very important study is the movement of white sharks. So how um, what is the migration pattern that they have? And we know that they go from the Gulf of Mexico up to Nova Scotia and Canada. And that's that's where they live. And they go on, on the co uh, close to the coast and then they come back. And they do that every year. 
and we know it because we put tags on them that is going to tell us their location. Uh, we have had a few findings some, uh, so far. One of them is that first, we didn't know those were the same animals that, that the people saw here in Florida were the same animals in, uh, in the Carolinas, and they were the same animals in Nova Scotia. So now we know it's the same population, that the same animals that are just moving around. So we know that they go to Nova Scotia. This was not known yet. And that the nursery is, is somewhere, it's in New York, um, outside New York. Um, there is there was a study that that uh, collected samples from the young of the year animals that are less than one year old, and we also know that this animal when they concentrate so much in one place, it's because they are eating there. So there those are the feeding areas, and they go from feeding area to feeding area. So in the picture you can see outside um, the the South and North Carolina, and also in Nova Scotia. So we know that they eat fish and we know in the south and we know that they eat, they focused more on um, marine, uh, marine animals, uh, seals specifically. Something that we still haven't figured out yet is what happens to the pregnant female because I have been doing the ultrasounds and we haven't gotten, but we haven't gotten a lot of mature females and I haven't seen a pregnant female yet. We don't know what is the length of the gestation and we don't know for sure what is the mating site. So we obviously have uh, a lot of uh, a hypothesis for all this but but we are still we are not done yet with this study so hopefully we are going to going to get an answer and it's to me it's so nice to participate in in something that is happening right now i'm collaborating with them i go on board and i help to do the exams and um we are applying the science you know applying the science and all the techniques that i that i learn here in the park i can do it with the white sharks so here are just pictures of the samples that we can get from those animals the first just the first one is the contender bringing the shark in uh, to the platform and then the platform is going to uh, uh, to to go be lifted uh, outside of the water so then the animal is going to be turned and you can see in the bottom picture there I'm doing an ultrasound and um, the animal goes the sharks go into tonic immobilization so they don't move so we don't need to use any kind of sedation any kind of handling um, because they don't move so you can just go get your samples do your exams measure and then put the animal back in the water and release and they are fine. And we know that they are fine because we use usually three type of um, tags. So we know that they, where they go and then we know that they are fine. So we get swabs from their teeth. That's very important because we know which kind of bacteria are in their mouth. Um, there is a picture where they are collecting muscle samples. The muscle samples are super important for a study on contaminants, uh, on mercury, how the animal is going to respond and how what is the concentration of this contaminant in the, in the sharks because sharks are apex predators. So they eat the large fish that eats the medium fish, that eats the small fish and all these animals and all the, the food chain, they are accumulating this uh some heavy heavy metals and this contaminant so then shark is going to accumulate all that so we want to examine them and 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 this is going to be like our database and this is really important because in the future are they going to do the better or are they going to do worse do we need to do something to help them and then the ultrasound i do an ultrasound of the whole body there is a specific study on hearts that it's very nice how how it works, what is the, 
the implications for an animal of this size. And I do the other organs are focused on the reproductive organs. I can tell if an animal is mature. I look for pregnancies and just uh, do a part of a, of a health assessment for this animal. Uh, we get a blood sample, of course. We can tell a little bit of a, about the diet and um, to see if the animal is healthy, to see if the animal is stressed because of this whole procedure. And we have gotten to the con conclusion that, that they are fine. Uh, there is a study on eye, on the parasites, so a lot of studies. And we are a small team and we get samples for a lot of people, uh, which makes it very, very nice, very interesting um, for me as a, as a veterinarian and as a scientist. So people sometimes ask me, ask me what is... Ugh, what is the largest shark that we ever caught? Uh, her name is Nagumi, and she was over 17 feet long. So that means that she is like the grandma. You know, she had had her uh, pups that have had her their pups. So this animal is considered to be um, above 50, above 60 maybe years old. And it was, um, it's unbelievable, really. <laughs> it's the only animal that we caught that was this size. It was uh, very exciting for the whole team when we learned that this happened. Uh, so this is our contribution to the ocean and how to make, uh, uh, how... it's very nice to be able to contribute to science that it's analyzing what is happening to the ocean, what is happening to this apex predator and see how they are doing how is this population doing so this is it's all about this and i will be able to answer a few questions now if there is any first of all thank you so much for that that was so interesting and i learned a lot um i mean so many different ways to look at reproduction and how we can help animals survive and applying those techniques to the field sites is just so Awesome to hear how you guys do that. Um, we do have a lot of students that are, you know, hopefully going, they want to go into the sciences. I, I personally know a lot that I've wanted to be veterinarians. Can you kind of briefly talk about the main challenges you face when getting started in your field? I need to think about it because, because I feel like like every person has a different path and has a different way to get where where he or she is and mine i feel that mine was so different because i come from i feel like i come from two different countries so i had different challenges i had to apply for a grant to do my masters so i had the challenge of financial challenge that was solved by having a grant. And um, I think I had, I, I had fear of not knowing if I was going to find a job after I studied what I really liked. And talking to the other like PhD students, I feel like that's a common fear. You study, you do your master's, you do your PhD, and then you're like, okay, and then what? Am I going to find a job? Am I going to do the same thing? And because it's so exciting, usually we pick a, a, a project that we really like, that, that we are really passionate about it, but we don't know if we're going to find a job on that. So I would say to be um to be open-minded you need to be open to have an open mind and kind of to follow the signs because like i said i i thought i was gonna work with i thought i was gonna work with jaguars and ocelots and i ended up working with the marine animals and it never never crossed my mind but i had an open mind and i said well that's okay because I, what I liked more than, than dolphins or sharks is reproduction. 
So that's my advice for, for the students is it's so much better, it's so much easier if you find an area in science that you like. So you like reproduction, you like uh, bacteriology, you like, um, you know, microbiology, or you like, um, I don't know, you like to run PCRs or you like the lab work. And then, but you also like sharks and you also like elephants, you know? So then it doesn't matter which species you're going to work with because you're always going to be happy because you're always going to do that, the science part that you really like. Sometimes maybe you like to, you like teaching, you like writing a book. There is so many ways to help the species that you like that, that that's so personal. I just say, don't get like stuck and don't get stubborn on, I want to work with sharks and I want to work with mako sharks, you know, because they are my favorite. It's like, well, you might end up working with sea stars or, <laughs> you know, uh, we don't know. We don't know. Or with fish. But sometimes if you're doing genetics and if you're doing, I don't know, DNA extraction extraction to do something and you're going to be happy, just find a way to be happy. I think this is this is my advice. So the challenges that I but the challenges that I faced was they were different. It was the financial because um, so I had a grant. Uh, I was sponsored by the Mexican, Mexican government uh, to do my, my master's degree and uh, the language. <laughs> I had to learn English. Uh, I did not study in a bilingual school. A lot of kids now uh, in Brazil or in Mexico, you can go to a bilingual school. I did not go to a bilingual school. So I had to learn Spanish in Mexico and, and then I learned uh, English mostly there too, taking classes. Um, what other challenge? I don't know, I, I, I think I was lucky, I guess. I was lucky because I didn't go into academia. So my story is different. I started with SeaWorld. I, I'm still at SeaWorld after 11 years working here, but also doing my master's. So since 2008, I have been here and I feel very lucky because I have always, I always have a species that I can work with. I always have people that I can work with and I have been able to help other researchers that, that want samples from our animals. So we do that too. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so really just like following your passion and finding something that you just love to do. And then, you know, doing some of that networking and, being known for what you do. So getting in with those search, you know, you're so good at what you do and you can apply it. So that's very great advice for our kids. Yes, be open-minded that what you learn, you learn a technique that you say, ah, but I don't like it very much. Oh, but I don't know what is, is it going to be good? Is it going to be worth it? And it might, it might open a door. It might be the difference from someone to picking you over somebody else for a project. So yes, yes, try to learn everything you can until you find your your passion. <laughs> Our fall research experience, including financial aid. So if you wanted to do your own research project, um, maybe something in you know reproduction, go ahead and visit our website and feel free to email me at any time. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. So with that, thank you again. And Giselle, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun telling you about my what I do. I really, I really like it, and I think uh, I'm very happy to see that a lot of a lot of kids and a lot of uh, students they they are really interested in in doing this and working in the field. And it is possible. Please don't think it's not possible because I see it all the time. And here in Florida, there are so many places that that people can do this and there's more and more and more. So don't give up on, on your dreams and on your goals. It is possible to do it. Oh, thank you for that. That's absolutely mm -hmm. true, guys. So. Thank you. <laughs>